get you a moderator. That's what happens. So if you get invited to be a moderator. <laughs> if you're lucky, someday you can be sitting right here. Exactly. You will graduate. Oh, man. Yeah. So just a heads up, we're going to do a couple miniatures of these at uh, Storyport, right? Uh, Radio Boise Stage. Radio Boise Stage, which is going to be on Grove Street between 11th and 12th. Free stage. Storyport Street, too, right? It is. Yeah. For now. Uh, uh, and we'll have a couple of those at prime time on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Someone in this room is probably going to be hosting one of those. So look forward to that. I'm not going to tell you. Oh, oh well, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. So uh, look for that. That's going to be like the third week in March. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, not only a couple listeners, but a couple people who are like embody supporting community radio and the community ethic and what keeps us out of corporate financing and corporate media hands. They've had house parties, they support us, and I think they've shown up to every one of these couch surfers. Mark and Rebecca. I always theorize if we had about 50 of those guys, we'd be totally set. <laughs> So anyway, I'll let Christian do the introducing of the performers and the moderators. I'm just about to introduce Mr. Christian. Really Christian. Right? Yeah, we can you. Yeah. Um, yes, thanks for your support. And I think you, this year, were the only like season ticket holders, which is going to really? be the, I believe so. <laughs> but I'm not in charge of the tickets. Elizabeth is. But, um, <laughs> so next year, starting in September, um, or earlier in September, we'll start the events in September. There are, you know, these season tickets you can buy, and you get a discount. And also, it inspires you, hopefully, to come to all of them, um, all six months. Of them. So I highly recommend it. You can see it? <laughs> all right. But yes, Malia Collins, one of my good friends and uh, an incredible writer of ghost stories, real <laughs> and otherwise. And um, also, as somebody who was here on the couch a couple months back yeah. as, a, as a storyteller and uh, just somebody who's going to guide us into the introduction of these two and carry the conversation more like the usual sort of halftime sort of five ten minute uh, intermission and um yeah malia thanks for being here oh gosh Take thanks for having me Good. hi everybody thanks for coming i this is um my bliss as i am totally obsessed with terry gross and I feel like maybe Terry Gross got her start doing something like this. And so I've been channeling Terry Gross all week. So thank you for coming. And I am so excited. Terry Webster is a dear, great, incredible writer friend of mine. And I just met Speedy, and he's lovely as well. So you're in for a good time. I'm, we're going to start with Speedy, and I want to introduce him. And I'm actually, he wrote a really beautiful and poetic uh, bio, so I thought I would just read his bio and then have him play some music okay. for us. So this is Bobby Speedy Gray, born in rural North Carolina, first learned acoustic blues from a janitor in a friend's family hardware store. Traveled the South playing guitar for a youth vocal group at age 12, played rock, prog, punk, glam, garage, and power pop all over the East Coast read The Number of the Beast by Robert Heinlein. Moved to Hawaii, laid in the sun, walked a lot, read The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford by Ron Hansen. Moved to Wyoming, played Western swing, cowboy songs, reggae, blues, and hard rock. Edited a mountaineering rag, read Brave Cowboy by Edward Abbey. Moved to Idaho, played cowpunk, pub rock, Indie, country, psychedelic roots rock, read No Country for Old Men by Cormac McCarthy. Leads Like a Rocket, Now is Ragged Coyote, started writing songs at 17, and still is. This is Speedy Gray. Um, so I'm going to play, I've got a new record. This is sort of the release of the record, like it's only been available for a couple days. Um, I'm going to play the first song off of it. Um, this is called Pearls on a String.
well, my old dog, he's as dumb as he can be. He sees a ghost in nearly every tree. And he don't know what makes the wind blow and how it comes and shakes away the leaves. Jesus, Joe, and Mary took everything they could carry and headed off to make a home in Idaho. And then Jesus said, now son, it don't matter where you're from, don't ever let them monkeys pin you down. Cause it takes far too long, it takes far too long, don't tell me that it has to be that hard. I'm alive on the wind, and I'm on my feet again. It must be beautiful to be a star. I remember the time you sat and cried on the floor. You said you traded all for just a little more. And then you said that part that always breaks my heart. How everything ends before it starts. And it takes far too long. It takes far too long. Don't tell me that it has to be that hard. I'm on my feet again, I laugh on the wind, and it must be beautiful to be a star. that old dog well, he just up and died I can still hear him barking on the breeze he says he's figured out what this whole damn thing's about and how everything's gonna be okay it just takes far too long it takes far too long and I tell you that it don't have to be that hard so get on your feet again you will laugh on the wind, and it's beautiful when you get to be a star. Well, it's beautiful when you get to be a star. CD on Friday and that's the first song on it and I listened to it as I was driving home and it was gray outside and late in the afternoon and I felt like it was just me and those words were like weather or atmosphere and I got home and sat in the driveway until I finished the entire CD it's incredible thank you you want to play another one I can yeah sure absolutely um this is one that's not on the CD. I'm in a, a band called Like a Rocket, and uh, uh, this is this is going to be our new record, which we're working on right now. Um, I, I'll skip some of the instrumental stuff because it's kind of long, um, but I, I don't talk a lot about what songs are about. I think you can kind of figure this one out, but uh, but if you do pay attention, I think there's an, an interesting thing that at the end of this story, um, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll talk about it, and, and maybe you guys can see what see what the there's an, uh, an ambiguous ambiguousness to it. Well, 
Well, I'm the man they called July Taylor. They say I killed Joe Emmett Brown. I stand accused of lonesome murder. Like a dog, they say I gunned him down. They drug me out of bed one winter evening. I followed somebody tracks through the snow. I asked me time again what I stood to gain. Sure as heaven above, I did not know. But when the sun comes up this April morning, they're gonna hang me by my neck until I'm dead. And tell my mama I'm gonna be with God. Live my life a righteous man. They found me guilty in a shadow moment. Though the gun didn't suit my hand, no testimony about them Parker brothers. No one stood for me in the stand. I ain't spoke a word since I was seven. I was kicked in the neck by a stubborn old demon mule. I never learned to read, cause Papa didn't see the need. And it was half a day's ride away from the nearest school. But when the sun comes up, this April morning They're gonna hang me by my neck Until I'm dead Tell my mama I'm gonna be with God I live my life A righteous man Please tell the miller's daughter that I love her. She kissed me once by the river ford. Maybe someday we would have married. That would have been a fine reward. Now I hear the preacher pray while he nails my coffin. Not built coffee and fresh baked bread. No one left alive knows my story. It'll lie buried here in my head. When the sun came up this April morning, I swung up on a rope till I was dead, dead and gone. And tell my mama I'm gonna be with God, live my life a righteous man. Yeah, tell my mama I'm gonna way back home and I live my life righteous thank you so speedy your songs have
have such a um, story to them and such a narrative flow to them. I, I'm curious if you would talk about um, how do you put a song together? Well, uh, th 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 there's lots of different processes that I have used. Um, I used to I used to write everything down, and I have like a a, a book that's just jam full of like you know 300 pages of songs that I finished or ideas and stuff. And then about five or six years ago, that started to not happen anymore. Um, I I I started to just have the songs in my head and that they, they would I didn't write them down and I would say anything that I've written in the, the well until this record anything I, I wrote for like six or seven years was never written down and sometimes I would even I, I, I used to play a, a residency at solid two nights a week two afternoons in the summertime and I would have ideas for songs in my head that I literally would play for the first time ever in front of an audience it's like I didn't know what was going to happen. It was like, okay, I think I can get through this. You know, it's, they don't know it. So if I mess up, you know, if I if I mess it up, they're not going to know. As long as I can just kind of like, okay, I forgot what happens next. Okay, I'll just play for a while. Um, yeah. A quick aside. I, I uh, years ago, uh, James McMurtry came and played at this little restaurant that, that that I worked at, and it was like really unusual for him to play. A re you guys know James McMurtry. So yeah, so he came and played in this really tiny little restaurant for like a hundred people, and it was great. And and uh, uh, he he played guitar like all night long. He would just play guitar and play guitar and play guitar, and then he'd sing a little bit and he'd play guitar. And I went, wow, that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to be able to do that. And so I started developing into that where I could just play guitar for like five or six minutes and then sing a song and then play guitar. And and I met him. Uh, like like a year ago when I told him what an influence that was and he said yeah I had laryngitis that night and I was like I built my entire solo career on you being sick uh, but I'm glad you guys are laughing nobody ever laughs at anything I say but uh, uh, going back to it uh, so I, I kind of went through that for a while but then I I started writing these songs for the, the, the I you know I can hear you through the clapping of the thunder and I was literally writing the lyrics, and I, I wrote them on in Google Keep, and I was constantly editing them and writing and editing. But there was nothing but words, really nothing but words. And for six months, I just I had nothing but words and no music. So then, I, last winter, I started going on walks, and I would just walk for hours with one of the songs, and not necessarily one particular one. But I would just be, I would say, which one is it that's going to come to me now? Which lyrics am I going to remember? And sometimes I pull out my phone and look at it. And then I just started finding the, those songs. And over, um, over 10 days in August, uh, and some of them have never been played except for just during that 10 days, I just went in the studio and, and, and recorded them. And I didn't, some of them I knew what I was going to do, and some of them it's like, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. So, and that's kind of the, that's the way, that's, if that answers, yeah, it's a, yeah. lots of processes, but this one was really unusual for me that I just, I, I don't know where it came from, so. And so, Carrie, you write poems. How do you put a poem together? Mm. I keep a notebook, also, and so a poem can come from a word, an image, an experience. It's hugely varied, and often it'll be a bunch of different things, and then somehow, they're synthesized, or you start to see connections, and they come together. Yeah. Um, so, Speedy, can I ask you a couple more questions yeah, sure. about your work? Yeah. And so, you talked about this a little bit, and I was saying that I was listening to your CD, Ragged Coyote, the other day. Is that the name of... What, what I, is I, Ragged Coyote? Ragged Coyote... Uh, is that I, a persona? That's me. Okay. It's I knew that there was a certain amount of baggage from being in Like a Rocket and playing solo gigs as Speedy Gray that would be kind of carried over, and I didn't want to have that. I wanted people to address this music as something that they didn't have any preconceptions about. Mm. Um, so I just created the title Ragged Coyote. That's the, that's me, but that's that way people just are like, they're going to look at it in the record store and go, oh, I don't know who this is. 
and maybe they'll buy it. So it's also, it's you and it's also the title. It, it is, yeah. Well, the title is actually, I, you know I can hear you through the clapping of the thunder. That's, okay. that's the actual title of the record, so. But I understand the confusion. Um, Wayne made me ask that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was listening to it. It's gorgeous if you haven't listened to it. And um, we talked a little bit about this, but there's a very Southern storytelling feel to it. And you've got two songs, two left feet, and something God might say. And listening to those really feels like being in the middle of a Flannery O'Connor short it's really story. Wild. And, That's really wild. That's really wild. I'm so curious where that Southern storytelling tradition comes for you. Well, the first thing I'll say, both of those songs I almost left off the record. I'm really glad that you like them, and, and, and not to, not to. I hope I'm not being rude, it's uh, it's not two left feet, it's two feet left, and the reason that it is that is because it's a, it's a homage to a, a bluegrass musician that I know from Jackson named Ben Winship, and he had a really great record called One Shoe Left, and the cover, he was sitting with barefooted on just his left foot, and I was like, okay, I'm stealing that, so, you know, and then I can talk about Ben and how great he is. Um, I don't really, I, okay, Get back to your question. Okay, the southern part, I can't help. That's just, you know, that's what I'm steeped in. It's like, if you're not from, I mean, I'm sure it's the same from wherever you're from, but if you're not from the south, you can't understand what it's like to be from the south. You're always going to, it's like it's very welcoming and all that stuff, but it's just so, you know, it's church and it's it's music and, and it's, 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 you know, Saturday night drinking, Sunday morning praying, all that kind of stuff, um, mm. which is even if you're not, like, I wasn't necessarily that kind of person, but it's still, you're just, you're just kind of like, well, you, you should be. Um, and the storytelling part of it, um, it's just, I, okay, I'll just, maybe that came from this, my, my family sat around on Sunday lunch and we would even, I'd even have friends that would come to come to Sunday lunch at my house because my dad was a, he was a Sunday school teacher and a theologian and you just wouldn't believe the bullshit that fool. I mean, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, and my, my mom had stories. My mom, before she died, wrote, it's not, it's not well written, but she wrote her memoirs so that everybody would know. And she told all these stories. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, some of the stories that flew around my family was my, my grandfather was apparently is related to Johnny Appleseed. He was a drummer for John Philip Sousa. I saw him do amazing things, and he also never spoke a word to me, like in the entire time he was alive. I, I swear to God, he mm -hmm. never spoke to me. But it was just like these rumors of like, so I don't know, maybe that's where it came from. So um, you traveled around the South growing up. Mm -hmm. You played guitar in a youth group. Then you played across the East Coast. You moved to Hawaii <coughs> and Wyoming. And I'm wondering, does that kind of life, the traveling and wandering even kind of life, make its way into the songs that you write? I, it, it does, uh, it, but actually what I think it more is, is not necessarily the travel itself, because I, I do travel, but I don't really enjoy it. But I do, I, I do enjoy, it's like the, the different environments that I'm in really affect what it is that the music is happening. Like I moved to Idaho and I don't know what it is. There's nothing wrong with you people, but all I write about is people dying out here. Like everything is about somebody getting shot in the desert. You know, like it's like that was like a good five years of like everything that every, like every single one of my songs had somebody that died in it. And now I've just decided, well, I'm not. Gonna, I just they die, but I just don't tell you that. <laughs> I just leave it out. Like, yeah, she later gets killed in a car accident, but you don't need to know that. So. And that um, this is self-serving, and so you lived in Hawaii. I'm Hawaiian. I did. I, I, it's very. It's compared to you. It's unfair to say that we lived there, but we were there for long enough that. Uh, go ahead, ask your question. So Sorry. I just want to talk about Hawaii. That's good. <laughs> so I guess is what I'm doing. So you lived in Hawaii. I'm Hawaiian, and I'm from Hawaii. And if you haven't been to Hawaii, it's there's something deeply um, spiritual and connecting to that place and it really figures deeply in my life and my own writing and I'm wondering what you thought about it when you were there and do you ever think about Hawaii when you're writing your songs? I, well it, I don't necessarily think about Hawaii 
Um, I, th it's really strange. Um, we were fortunate enough to, um, uh, Jennifer, my girlfriend's um, aunt and uncle, but Uncle Lou, um, he was the curator of the Museum of Natural History. Uh, and he had traveled the world. They had traveled the world. And they took us in and gave us half of their house to live in. And it was just this, oh, it was, it was just so brilliant. Like, um, there was a connection with the Kennedy's doctor with your family, right? Something like that. And just like he would, you'd ask him about coconuts and he would say, well, do you really want to know? And then, <laughs> and then if you did, he would have just like the most in, wonderful little lecture that he'd give you with books to read about coconuts. So I don't really think about Hawaii like that, but, but what I did, the reason I include that in the biography, the strange thing was when I thought about the time I was in Hawaii, the thing that I think about most was getting the assassination of um, Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford in, in a uh, thrift store and sitting outside, not even on the beach, just outside their house under a palm tree in the sun and reading that book. And that book just had a huge impact on me. So I don't think about Hawaii, but I do think about what happened in Hawaii that, I don't know if you guys have read that book or seen the movie, but it's amazing. So Does that, yeah. Yeah, that answers it. And it reminds me of what Carrie and I were talking about, thinking about the books that we grew up that influenced our girlhood mm -hmm. and our selfhood. And um, I want to introduce Carrie. Okay. This is Carrie sitting up here with me. And... Um, She's the author of three books of poetry, The Trailhead, which came out last spring and is transcendent. Um, everybody needs to read it. Grand and Arsenal, and We Do Not Eat Our Hearts Alone, as well as two chapbooks, Psalm Project and Rowing Through Fog. Her poems have appeared in many literary magazines, including Poetry, The Boston Review, Kenyan Review, Guernica, which I think I forgot and I felt like such an ache of um, envy oh. today. When well, I was sold to Guernica. That's was, how you remember that. Guernica is an incredible magazine. Um, Indiana Review, Grimoire, Los Angeles Review, and Denver Quarterly. She received her MFA from Indiana University. And we didn't know this at the time, but I was in graduate school in Hawaii, and we did an entire issue of writing based on writers from Carrie's MFA program in Indiana University, which we didn't know until like 20 years later when we talked about it. She's a recipient of the Whiting Award, of Whiting Award and the Lucille Medwick Award from the Poetry Society of America. She was a visiting writer at Washington University in St. Louis from 2006 through 2010, and she currently teaches in the MFA program at Boise State. And she's an incredible poet, and she's going to read some of her work. Yes. Thank you, everybody. So speaking of the stories that shape us, I think stories can shape us for better, but sometimes also for ill. And the first poem that I'm going to read is called The Spinster Project, and it had kind of a funny origin. I was in St. Louis um, staying with my friend, the memoirist Kathleen Finneran, and we had gone to see this movie called The Homesman, which is, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a Hilary Swank, Tommy Lee Jones movie. And in the movie, Hilary Swank is portrayed as this um, somewhat pitiful spinster who eventually, partly owing to her plainness and her sad romantic life, hangs herself. And so it's this sort of upside down world where Hilary the spinster is homely and Tommy Lee Jones, who's like 80, is the hottie in the movie <laughs> and the object of the, desire, of the object of desire. So by the time I left the movie theater, I was so pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and I say this as a spinster, a deliberate spinster. So this is a spinster project. Spinster loves you in her house with her teeth. Spinster's busy, called squints letters into shapes. Spinster whistles her blue dog back from the blue dark woods. Spinster is having a vision, so please leave her be. Spinster's house is smaller than your house and your house and yours, yours, yours. Watching Criminal Minds, Spinster is glad she never married a sexual sadist who keeps eyeballs in cur jars. Other creatures spinsters never lawfully wedded, the state, 
Deans of Humanities, Bank Accounts, 6 a.m. Spinster goes around all day thinking vitreous humor as she looks and looks. Spinster considers writing a manifesto about authority, but Spinster is authority. Spinster owns time and slices it like the sweetest pear tartlet. Spinster sleeps with monsters, and June's been quite the manticore, heavy pod muse trundling through her sleep. To stay fully spinstered, Spinster has an IUD. By night, she sings to the egg as it leaves her body. Hallelujah, little egg. Godspeed, little you in your fine blood apparel. Adios, my sweet petite iron tang bomb to nowhere. Spinster's bleary from staying inside your book for so long, but thank you. Spinster adores her some pink lingerie. Spinster is standing in the desert. The desert is standing around Spinster. They exchange molecules. Spinster thought of having an imaginary daughter, but the thinking made her tired. Within minutes, she was leaving her imaginary daughter on the orphanage steps, no pin to her sweater sign. Fondly, your Spinster. Spinster knows she's becoming an erratic, a boulder left by retreating ice. Spinster's new lover has bought her a diamond. ruh -roh, says Spinster to the white dog, their brows furrowed and cross-species commiseration. It's possible that Spinster is secretly the taxidermist of your hopes and dreams. There's a covert op designed to unspinster Spinster. Its code name is the whole fucking history of the wide, wide world. Spinster knows her breath is a mimetic representation of clouds, clouds a meontic representation of mystery, a barely there of the there but where. In the movie where Spinster hangs herself from the tree because Spinster, Spinster knows as soon as the swinging blue corpse enters the frame that this screenplay was written by a man. Spinster wants to literalize your desire inside her mouth. Spinster pawns her watch to buy herself a hair comb, her hair comb to buy herself a watch chain. Bald, she hangs the comb from the chain and proceeds clangingly. In all seriousness, Spinster knows she has gotten born at exactly the right moment in exactly the right place, knows there are a few billion girls who cannot construct an agentic spinsterhood, girls who decide denied their spinster destinies as soon as blood starts to leak from them may choose to set themselves on fire spinster needs an epoch to think about that spinster resolves to spin spinster better harder faster in the phraseology of her childhood she has the technology spinster kills what botanists say even a monkey could water in a rare but pleasing meeting of word origin, insect, sort of, and kismet, spinster is suggestive of spinning, of weaving, as per spider, as per web, hence many last names. Spinster concubines the whiskey. Spinster courtesans the empty lot. Spinster Jezebel's the very air until it is much more interesting air. Spinster considers that the original spinsters were holy women that to declare full spinster you'd show up at God's embassy, ask for asylum, and wait to be let in. Spinster knows that all paths of chosen are gorgeous, but secretly feels it's no coincidence that our greatest poet was a spinster. Spinster does not think she is holy in the manner of, say, rivers or radioactive wolves, but maybe a little holy. Spinster worries she is becoming an isolate, a language with no discernible roots. Spinster licks the peach juice off her hand. You want to read another one? Yes, I'll read another one. This is another sort of reclaiming. Um, it's a retelling of the... Um, story of Deborah, who is a prophetess in the Bible. If you went to Sunday school, you might be familiar with Deborah, of Deborah. Deborah was a prophetess. She sat under a palm tree and knew what you're doing tomorrow. All around, armies, cities burned, etc. Tomorrow you're buying pants. 
Deborah is a terrible name for a prophetess. Chariots, she says, sucking a plum stone. Scorpions and nettles. Toy guns and gumball machines. Deborah wonders what's prophecy, what's merely obvious. Drought, she says, her throat drying out. She knows the man will have the tent pin jammed into his skull, chooses not to warn him. Who am I to reroute history, says Deborah, employing the metaphor of the stone in the current. The goat wanders off. Deborah sees the wires running under everything, knows there's a mouse in your cistern. To be a prophetess is to witness world's end ad nauseum. A sailor of less than average acumen bashes the dodo's skull with a rock. The seas rise. A widow doesn't make love for 10 years. Most of the things kings ask Deborah are fuck-witted things. Should I start a war? Should I go to the war already begun? Deborah washes their questions from between her legs. Iron chariots shake the ground. This is a tiny shit box of land, she says, gesturing towards the desert. Evenings in the mountains are melting again. Deborah knows all, knows all zealots are boy men. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake and utter a song. So she sings about how, when the waters retreat, a fluvia gathers at her door. She also has a very good song about monkeys and one about righteous acts. Deborah reaches out to catch the bowl of plums before it begins falling. Can I ask you some questions? Yes. So, Carrie, over the years, we've talked a lot about growing up readers and writers. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about the ways when we were younger, how we created safe spaces for ourselves by reading and writing. And I'm wondering if you want to talk about that a bit, the impact of reading and writing and that space that you created for yourself as you were growing up and the words that you loved. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think as, as teachers of writing... You know, there's a phrase in our pedagogical lexicon, which is the safe space, right? Mm -hmm. And something that I've come to realize after 20 years of teaching from writers in the schools, kids from like fifth grade up to graduate students is that for girls under patriarchy, there's no such thing as a safe space, really. And so when we talk about that, we might be offering a false promise. But for me, as an anxious little kid growing up in Boise, Idaho, books were my refuge and kind of my fortress. And I would sit in my bed or I would sit in my backyard on the Boise bench and I would read and that would be my safety. Yeah. And do you remember what you read, what you loved? Yes, and I brought in an excerpt. So, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> So this is something that I would bet almost everybody in this room has read, but it's a passage from the Chronicles of Narnia. And I like it because it includes for me a space that seemed just very, very safe when I was little. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors they tried led only into spare bedrooms, as everyone had expected that they would. But soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armor, and after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner, and then came three steps down and five steps up, and then a kind of little upstairs hall, and a door that led out onto a balcony, and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books, and some bigger than a Bible in a church. And shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty, except for one big wardrobe, the sort that, was, that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all, except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. Lucy stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she was sure it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. 
She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it is very foolish to shut oneself into any wardrobe. Soon she went further in and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as not to bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers, but she could feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder if that is more mothball, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood on the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. That is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. Next moment she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Mm. It still holds up. It still holds up. And I didn't remember until I went back and looked at it that it's actually the youngest kid and the younger girl who ventures further in when the rest are all like, no, let's not go in there. So that made me happy. Yeah. What about you? What was growing up in Hawaii? Being little Malia <laughs> and reading. Uh, and read like. So I am so glad you asked that question. I grew up in Hawaii, but in a house with no books. I, mm. My parents weren't readers. My siblings weren't readers. Um, and we lived in a tiny house and there were five kids. So there was no, there was no space. And so the only, and everybody was really loud and really um, into being like Olympians. It seems like everybody was <laughs> swimming or surfing and I was really shy and I really liked reading and I would hide between, my dad had this Junkalunky boat that he always talked about fixing and he never ever fixed and I would hide in the boat because mm -hmm. no one could find me there or I would hide behind this um, tree my parents called the money tree and every morning they'd say oh Malia go out and see if there's any money in this money tree and I was like yes today's gonna be the day I always thought there was gonna be something and there never was but those were my spots and so reading and writing was something that I did in secret it was mm -hmm. something that I did so nobody else could find me and so that was my refuge that was my place in a really chaotic um difficult at times house to be inside of mm -hmm. and uh i was hoping you would ask that so i also bought an excerpt of <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite pieces and i was thinking about this when i was looking for it today and there weren't any books but there was one book called The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Did anybody read that or see the movie? And I thought that was the only book in the house, but when I was rereading this, I thought that was the book I carried everywhere. And hmm. I can think of moments in my life where something was happening and I was always in charge of the little kids and I would have The Secret Garden. That was the way that I sort of read our way out of whatever difficult moment had arisen. And so I was thinking about that today, that I think I must have carried it with me everywhere because every memory I have of reading from it, I'm reading to my younger siblings mm -hmm. somewhere at the park. I remember reading to them once in the bathroom with the door locked. I mean, that was the... I had it with me all the time. And there's a passage that I love and... I think when I read it when I was very young, it made me realize sort of the, that the world was really beautiful, but it was also fleeting. And I think when you're a kid and you realize that, that can also be very scary. Hmm. And so this is from The Secret Garden. <clears throat> one of the strange things about living in the world is that it is only now, and then one is quite sure one is going to live forever and ever and ever. One knows that sometimes 
when one gets up at the tender, solemn dawn time and goes out and stands alone and throws, one head, throws one's head far back and looks up and up and watches the pale sky slowly changing and flushing and marvelous unknown things happening until the east almost makes one cry out and one's heart stands still at the strange, unchanging majesty of the rising of the sun, which has been happening every morning for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And when I was a kid, I would tell my parents, the sun's going to come up tomorrow, right? And they'd say, yeah. And I said, that just seems like such a leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> one knows it then for a moment or so, and one knows it sometimes when one stands by oneself in a wood at sunset and the mysterious deep gold stillness slanting through and under the branches seems to be saying slowly again and again something one cannot quite hear however much one tries. Then sometimes the immense quiet of the dark blue at night with millions of stars waiting and watching makes one sure and sometimes a sound of far off music makes it true and sometimes a look in someone's eyes. And that was mm. that passage. There was something that I thought all of this can be happening, but there's something steady about the natural world. Mm. And I knew that as a kid, it's something that I think about a lot. C can I ask you as guys, an adult? Yeah. A, a couple. Uh, uh, this is a two part question. I'll start with you, but okay. I'd like to hear your answer too. When you're writing, what are you thinking about? How are you thinking about it being perceived? Are you thinking about being read? Or are you thinking about reading it when you like? W it, it, ah. you know? And then I have an, I want to follow up with that. Yeah. Whatever your answer is, I think for me I'm definitely more of a page poet, so I think about the words on the page. More, so you're thinking sure. that somebody's going to read this, okay? So yeah, I'm thinking it's going to be in a book and somebody's going to read the okay. book. Okay. Yeah. Then when you are performing it, when you're reading it, mm -hmm. I'm curious how much are you are you reading it? Are you visualizing? what's happening in your head do you do you use the page the written word to remind yourself of what to say or does it do you use it to because i noticed that writers and poets tend to read mm -hmm. aloud mm -hmm. whereas musicians I, it, like that would i would get completely lost in the in the in the right in the, the words on the page and not in the moment and so i'm curious as to how that is for you when you're when you're performing it where, where are you in your head? Yeah, I think that a lot of times I am picturing it. And I, it's funny because I just learned recently about this really strange phenomenon disorder called aphantasia, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, we all have a mind's eye. If I say horse, everybody in this room, unless you have aphantasia, pictures a horse. But for people with aphantasia, when they read or when they hear something, they literally picture nothing. Mm -hmm. It's the wildest thing. It's the wildest thing. And so, yeah, I mean, I think poets are very image-focused creatures. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm writing it and then when I'm reading it, I'm focused on the images. And for me, the image is before the sound, but the sound is also hugely important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same question, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I think about it, too. I think about it on the page that someone would be reading it and um, when I'm reading I feel transported to that place which is why I think I like writing about Hawaii so much mm -hmm. is that when I sit down to write I get to think about it when I'm reading it I get to think about it and um, I also like the sound of language and looking at the words on the page and moving them around that way but I really like reading and hearing the words as I'm writing them and sometimes I'll just stop and and read a sentence that seems okay on the page but once I read it out loud it feels like it goes on for a beat or two too long and I mm. need to go back in and I, it, take something out. I hear when I try to read poetry I can't get my I can't get to that space but when I hear you read it mm -hmm. aloud it just that's when it becomes alive for me. Like I, I, I've tried to read poetry and it just, I just don't, I can't get in there. I can't get those visuals. But then when I hear somebody reading it, I'm like, oh, 
now I see what they're talking about. So this is, and maybe that's the reason I'm a musician and you guys are poets, but that it's like, I, I have to hear it aloud before I really get into that space. And even with myself, I mean, I have the images in my head when I'm writing, but it's, it's really when I'm performing, it's, it's, I'm just off somewhere else. You know. And what for you comes first, the melody or the lyrics? You know, I don't, that's a really wonderful question. And I would say probably the lyrics, although during that period where I was writing everything in my head, during that period, I would, it, it would be like, it would come at the same time. Mm. And then I would say, okay, now I got to figure out what's, re what's the rest of this. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what story am, is this telling? But, but yeah, it's seldom do I ever, I find that when I write music and try to put lyrics to it, then I'm just kind of making stuff up. Yeah. But when I write lyrics, whether it's mentally or whatever, that actually is where the space is for me. Mm. So. Mm. so it seems like a good time to take a break. We're coming up on, how are we doing on time? Mm, 6.55, so we're good. Yeah, if you want time. Do you have anything to close it out, or if you want us to go there? Yeah, no, let's close it out with yeah, okay. Speedy. Can you close uh, yeah, us I, out? I can. And we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and have some more music. Carrie's going to read some more poetry. You'll have to give me a second to get tuned here, but... Uh... I wasn't sure what I was going to do. <laughs> Make sure that's... Yeah, that'll work. Uh, so this is... This is a song off of, uh, um, I, you know I can hear you through the, the, the clapping of the thunder. <laughs> this is called River's Chorus. The way the sun sometimes hangs Tangerine, the western sky, and to the world, a subtle change, green gold in your eyes, pretty words slip away. To become a river's chorus, no one knows, no one sees you and me. And two fast horses. Starbound hair, unbridled smile. I hear you sing around my door. Steel guitars, three quarter time, and Boot Hills walls across the floor. Pretty words, they slip away to become the river's chorus. No one knows, no one sees you and me. Two fast horses.
wrote a poem on the shoulders of a lazy mountain stream. Send my letters to the sea. Never say what they do. Pretty words, they slip away to become a river's chorus. No one knows, no one sees you and me. Fast horses carry me to that yonder hill and lay me down in sheets of heather. A storm will come. Lightning strike this world we build of wood and leather, and I will surely live forever in the circles of your eyes. No one knows what you. You and me Two fast horses No one knows No one sees You and me Two fast horses Yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you for coming back. Um, we're going to start with Carrie's poetry because it's incredible. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Malia. This poem is called Invert Sky. I poke the wound of steadfast longing with this switch pulled from the creek. A man puts my hair in his mouth. What I want is to sit across the table from women and sop our bread in oil. The antlers on the bench build a pretty thicket. I am willing the days to be quiet, delusion of snow and echo, stupendous become endless, awful become full. Meat dissolves into broth. The first wound was contrition. The second wound was compassion. Someone painted a constellation in this bowl, and I support that decision, I do, though beauty is more often brutal. Naked at midnight, I throw stones at the animals who would disembowel my animals. The milk shoots straight from the saint's breast into the beggar's mouth. The chapter headings read, the body in space, the abject body, the body absent. I take my body along the trail, quartz in the stream. I was sorry, and then I felt too much, and then I could not stop longing. I bite my nails, swallow the keratin. Pica, the body knows what it needs. Chalk and drywall, potassium and mercy. When I pretended not to have a body, I wasn't very free. So it's great having a really smart poet as your friend, and I think about um, 
my one of my most vivid memories of Carrie is we were both teaching up in Haley when we were teaching at the Cabin Summer Writing Camp. At and Ezra Pound's house. At Ezra Pound's Ooh. house, which is totally haunted. <laughs> if you haven't been there. Unabashedly chains, dripping, <laughs> like hands on the neck. And um, we, Carrie loves collecting rocks. Mm. And so we would go down um, to the river and Carrie would collect rocks. But in Hawaii, you don't collect rocks because they're alive and you don't want to move the spirit from one spot to another. And so Carrie was collecting these rocks and I was just super tense on the riverbank. I was like, we got to get out of here. This is messed up. And she's like, Lynn, it's not. And she said, take a rock. And I said, do you remember this? Yeah, I remember this very well. Because I, I felt like a colonizing I bitch. Said, <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. Um, but I, I said, what? And I just put my hand up like shaking and she put the rock in it and it was in the shape of the heart mm. and uh i thought my mother is gonna kill me <laughs> and but i live i mean i i i'm still alive i still have that rock but she pays such great attention to everything around her and i feel like being with carrie is the best way to be in idaho because i start to pay attention to things that i don't think i normally would and so I want to ask you about that you grew up here mm -hmm. and you left for graduate school in Indiana and then you were the visiting writer at Wash U in St. Louis for a number of years and now you're back in Boise teaching in the MFA program at BSU and so much of your work seems very deeply grounded in this place in Idaho and I'm wondering when you were away did you want to find your way back here? And do you have an Idaho poem or two that you could share with us? Yes, and yes. <laughs> so when I was away, it was always my contention to come back. And in my experience, Boise is a place that people leave and uh, then they come back. Portland does not hold its sway forever <laughs> and they wind up back here in my experience. So yeah, and and you know, I do have a long connection to this place. Um, my family came to Idaho in 1860 and settled in such places as Rexburg, Idaho, where Carly Walker, former student, <laughs> is from, and Camas County, where 20% of kindergartners do not get vaccinated because their parents do not believe in vaccination. So it's a mixed history, but yeah, a strong, <laughs> a strong connection to the natural world, which is what keeps us all in Idaho, I think, ultimately. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read, so the trailhead has a lot of walking poems in it. Um, there's a hill walk, there's a river walk, um, there's a whole gulch poem that I'm going to read. But always in my mind, uh, when I was writing the trailhead, I had this poem in my head from my friend and mentor, Jane Mead. And it's from her book, The Usable Field, and it's called Walking Blues. So, Walking Blues. Rain's so dark, I can't get through train going by in a hurry. The voice said walk or die. I walked the train and the voice all blurry. I walked with my bones and my heart of chalk, not even a splintered notion. Days of thoughts, nights of worry, lonesome train in a hurry. I love that poem and that sentiment, the voice said walk or die, I walked, was in my head mm -hmm. the whole time I was writing the trailhead. So, this poem is called This is Manifest. What I needed to survive was currents moving over my body, also bourbon. <laughs> Saw light through the trees, serum, lantern. Baby, I said to the man kneeling between my legs, there are kit foxes out there and they hum when they learn a new thing, like ledges or stream boarding. For years, my soul was little more than an embassy. I was lush and then lush and then more lush. In all of my opening, who had I actually saved? I was no one's bodhisattva. And so I removed my body from the systems walk the hills by night. My blisters filled with sticky fluid. 
a swan made a freakishness -ness of its neck. I was a woman of such secret knowledge as you may think mad. I don't know why, when we die, all our skulls aren't jeweled. Sometimes I was so enamored of sky, I felt my milk might come in. So when I was growing up, the, the foothills were largely undeveloped. And then they started to be developed. And thankfully for all of us, there was a group of people who thought we have to stop this. Right. But I have a lot of memories of, say, being in high school and getting drunk in half-finished houses <laughs> in the foothills. And when I came back, I just I missed walking in the foothills and on the green belt so much. And so this poem is called Hull's Gulch, and Malia actually makes an appearance, which we'll talk about after. <laughs> Hull's Gulch. Months from any tree becoming remotely fragrant, yet one cannot remain in bed. What if, by the time things for Scythia, we no longer recognize the flora, believe it's some sort of apocalypse, are possibly afraid? My paw clots a sharpness at the temples. The sky pretends it's simple. I have no quarrel with figments. Night garden, wet stone, small alien ships of seed pods tangled on the barbed wire. Here is the skull of the hummingbird on a chain around my neck. Let us pretend it is fleshed, the chain a leash. Let us be sad souls who keep bones on silver threads. In the theater, the couple in the next row masturbated each other in the dark, small dove noises as the city burned. After, I drove into the hills, past the reedy underbrush that pretends at fire. I hiked on. The pall did not dissolve, though I felt a little better. Thank you. Here the trailhead. Here the sagebrush. Here the creek. The glass house on the cliff. The telephone wires. The dust kicked up so that I am never without my vials of eye drops. Thinking for hours together of having the knife she gave me put in a silver case, the hair in a locket, and the pocketbook in a gold net, the absence is tangible as hummingbird skulls. Having come to the trailhead, I crave a speechless place caught up in a gold net. Grit in my teeth and the sky about to tear, I peer into the cleft two boulders make. I to the dark, I hear impossible water. I am learning to allow for visions. The cliffs give up a sound like howling, which merge, merges with actual howling to become a system of enormous potential. A lightning thicket, a road sliced out of winter, a tooth buried in the bark of a tree, a bowl of lathe yew, a yew split like a peach but still bleeding. I walk and walk, like a jellyfish or annunciation, the heliodor yellow underlying everything shimmers is gone. Often when I wake, the furniture slightly haloed, sleeping pills screwing with the visual cortex, a pleasant holiness. I believe he went home with her smell on his fingers. I believe that on the trail are many handsome dogs. The acedia hums and hums. Soon, excess and magnolia, snow in the mountains moving towards us as runoff, great volumes of water pulled into the valley, swans on the riverbank drinking that snow. I will sit by the trail until my head stops hurting. I will try not to be afraid. And Malia, would you like to illuminate the moment in which you come into the poem? <laughs> so uh, we're at the flicks. <laughs> we're at the flicks. Carrie and I saw every movie at the flicks. And, uh, it was Lincoln. Ooh, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln. Steven Spielberg's Lincoln. <laughs> Indeed. And we we're sitting in the second row, and there was a couple in the front row uh -huh. pleasuring each other. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> at the flex, not even Edwards. <laughs> I know. <laughs> where it's so quiet. I mean, movies at the flex are quiet. You can't even open your red vines. <laughs> and that was going on in the front row, which is why you have to pay attention to everything, because that just turned out being a funny story to me and then and I was so pissed Carrie that she didn't tell me this while the movie was going because <laughs> it would have made you know it's not that great of a it's, movie and it's really. long it's so that long. was a nice break in the <laughs> <laughs> so um 
<laughs> anyway, beware. <laughs> so, we have, um, so there are a couple of our students in the audience. Jared, who's doing the video, is my former student from CWI and a great writer, and I'm so excited to see him here. And then Leanne was up here in the front row, and my beloved student at CWI and ended up being Carrie's student at Boise State. And I just wanted to ask you about that. So we've got a couple of students in our audience, and I think about when I was a writer and, and in writing school and learning how to write, and some of the teachers I had who were wonderful and some who were not wonderful at all. And um, now that you're teaching, do you think of your role as a teacher, a teacher and a mentor differently? And I'm wondering, did you ever have a great writing mentor or a great life mentor? I've, I've had a few, thankfully. The poet Jane Mead, who I mentioned, my friend Kathleen Finneran, who's a memoirist, you certainly. But I think that when you don't appreciate those relationships until you become a teacher and a mentor yourself, and then you realize what a privilege it, it really is um, to do that. And it's part of a, a, a continuation, so a, a sad story. Um, I had a, a former student, a dear, beloved former student, whose name is Marnie Ludwig, and she published a book called Pinwheel. Um, and she passed away last month of a heroin overdose, um, which kills me and will continue to kill me. But I was just delight, delighted and it brought me great peace to see that on her Facebook page, when people were writing their memorials, there were students of hers from Columbia mm -hmm. who were talking about what a great teacher and mentor she was. And just the idea that they will take that knowledge and they will carry it forward into their books and into their classrooms. It just, it brings me a great deal of solace, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? I have had good writing teachers. Um, when I was an undergraduate, Rick Bass, who's actually the visiting fiction writer at BSU this semester, mm -hmm. um, years and years ago, was a visiting writer at Beloit, and he was generous, and he would always start class with reading a short story. And I remember he read Joy Williams' Escapes, and um, he read a Richard Ford short story called The Communist, and there's an image in The Communist and a, a mother says to her young son, um, do you still think I'm pretty? And mm. that line comes up to me now as an adult. I don't know if it resonated um, as much then as it does now, but he also had the line, the mother is in this difficult relationship with a terrible man and she loves him. And she, her son's asking why, and she says, my favorite animal, I love geese and geese mate for life. They're special birds. And that idea that geese mate for life, they're special birds and this young son not being able to figure out this relationship. I, there, I still think of these moments that these teachers, great teachers that we have who give us that kind of center me still and keep me on the page. So he was a great writing mentor. I had another um, great writing mentor in graduate school. Um, Morgan Blair. She was crazy, but she was wonderful. <laughs> and I think of their generosity, and I remember what that did for me as I was coming up as a writer, and I hope to do the same for my students. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. How about you? A mentor? Yeah. You know, no. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll give... I gave my friend Johnny Shoes Pisano and, and, and Wayne their credit on this record as kind of being executive producers because I was able to, I usually, you know, I don't know, it's too hard to explain, but I was able to bounce 
ideas off of them without them knowing that that's what I was doing. Like, mm. like I, I, like I, 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 I told both of them that I was going to um, have them get their opinion on the music, but then I didn't because I, I wanted it, but I didn't, but I had to, it was still precious. So I, I'll give Wayne and, and Johnny the, the most mentoring credit that I could think of. But it's, yeah, um, the, the music world, I unfortunately, the, at least when I grew up in, is so competitive and it's so hard to find somebody. Like, like I see it already happening here in Boise with these, these, these kids that I see that are like 17, 18 years old, that, that it's like they're already starting to try to bury the other guy. <laughs> and, and it's just, that's just, unfortunately, that's not in all the music scene. Because, you know, there's famous stories of people like Guy Clark that did mentor and bring songwriters along and help them out. But but it's just, it's like, man, I got, you know, this is my spot on stage and you can't be a part of it. That's such a big thing in music. So, unfortunately, no, you know. Um, I, I mean, I can even reflect, this didn't happen to me, but a friend of mine went to Berkeley School of Music and the very first thing they told him from every professor from the very beginning was you're never going to make it because I'm better than you and I, I didn't make it. Huh. And that's just very mm -hmm. typical in the music industry. Uh, well, what's left of the music industry? Like I, think, I think that that's often been the tradition in many different fields of the arts. But and I, honestly, I think it's often a very patriarchal tradition. Of it could be. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think one of the things that is important to me as a, as a woman poet is that I am part to my students that there's actually absolutely room for all of us. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, there's room for them, and I'm here to, to lift them up, just as people have lifted me up, definitely. Well, and I, I think about um, how competitive writing can be and having Carrie, who's mm. an incredible writer and poet and, and friend, to remind me of why we're trying to do what we're doing and reminds me to sit down and work. And it's mm. also good to have a friend who's always writing because then you think, shit, I got to <laughs> sit down and get some work done. And so I, and there's something about that, having that encouragement from someone close by who's in the same community of writers and, and people that you're in. And I think surrounding yourself with community is important. Mm, well, absolutely. and I'll, I'll say too that just based on what you just said, I found like over the past few years, it's like I've quit. I don't care about, I mean, you guys just don't even really exist to me. It's like, I, I mean, I used to care and now I don't anymore. I just play the music for myself and I'm glad that people seem to enjoy it, but I don't care. And in that, I've been able to connect with people like, like Johnny Shoes, who we're kind of like, you know, Johnny's in a very successful band called Tyler and the Train Robbers, and there's no jealousy between us whatsoever because we just don't, we're not in each, I, I literally, like, I just don't care. Nobody takes a gig from me anymore because I don't, I don't care, you know, and it used to be like, oh, why are they doing that? And it's like, ah, whatever, you mm. know. So that, that, I think maybe getting more secure mm. helps but yeah, early on, no. I, I would like to throw in a really go go back a step to your 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 rock story, which I, I know I know the stuff about Hawaii and, and, and the rocks there and your thing and it just brought to mind we were hiking I'll make this brief, we were hiking in Jackson in a pla a, a place called Granite Hot Springs and we were going up a fairly unused trail. Um, you get a little bit outside of Jackson, um, Wyoming and there's a lot of trails that get used sometimes for hunting and stuff but they so we're walking along this trail and I I don't know why I, there was like five or six of us and and I don't really know why I decided I didn't want to go ahead and I just sat down like by this creek called Granite Creek and just sat there and said you guys have to come back this way I'll just be here and they, they're going well we're just going to go up there it'll be like you know 30 minutes or an hour and I'm like oh it's cool I'm just going to hang out by the water so I'm sitting there in like a really obvious place to sit on the creek and I'm just sitting there, and I look down, and there's this hole. And I can't remember exactly what it looked like or what I had to do, but there was rocks in the hole. And it's like, it's protected. There's the creek, and there's rocks, and there's this hole, and there's rocks in there. And I reached down and started pulling them out, and they were tools. 
Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. And they were like, I was just amazed and everybody came back from the hike and I was I like, and I was like, look at these, these are tools. Like how long have these been here? Wow. You know, they weren't, they, they were just stone, but they were obviously shaped. Um, there, there weren't like axes or things, but they were, and it was like, well, that's really cool. You know, mm. it's like, I wanted to take them, but <laughs> then it's like, no, they've been here for, I don't know, several hundred years and. They should stay here, but yeah, I wow. thought that maybe that your rock collecting yeah. thing might. No, I feel even worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Just, yeah. But Carrie, <laughs> Carrie liberated me to other things, and I, I think when I think about being a writer and showing up in the world as a, as a writer and someone who makes sense of things and sometimes difficult things through a narrative, and we were on a walk up by Table Rock, and we were talking about this idea of. What's your north? It was a time where I felt sort of unmoored and we were talking about what's our north? What's that thing that centers us and brings us back to who we are and what we love? And as we were having this conversation, I looked down and there was a compass right on the side of the oh, cool. trail. And I thought, well, I'm with Carrie so I can pick up that compass and I'm going to be all right. <laughs> but I, I really believe that when you show up fully present and aware of the magic that can happen when you pay attention mm. that magical things do present and I think how sad that must be when you're not paying attention and it's a good mm. reminder and I feel like you should read another poem to remind us of why we need to pay attention in this oh, world. I will. But first, <laughs> in terms of continuing the cycle, you developed an assignment for your students in which they write about their north, right? Yeah. Yeah. I never got an assignment that cool in composition. <laughs> never. Okay, so I have this weird affliction, um, and it's called Addie's Tonic Pupil. And it is this weird thing that started six or seven years ago, but one of my eyes is always partially dilated. It's very strange and um, painful, really, because it means that when I go outside, light hits that other eye more. And apparently it could go away any day, or it could be this way forever. So this poem is called One Eye Dilated, and it's actually about looking, even when your eyes are screwed up. So, one eye dilated. Months of one eye dilated, light flooding in, a constant low-grade headache. I feel in conversation asymmetrical and want to look away, yet also know it to be beautiful, like the husky across the street, green, blue, or the burnt-down church next to the standing church. From this new fixity, the dilated eye, how much light there is, a lot. How our bodies, in their mercy, keep us from it. The dilated thing is made in its own expanded image. Time dilation is when another's clock moves more slowly than your own, which is unfair, because then that person gets more of everything. The cervix is dilated when the intrauterine device is inserted. The following questions are suggested post-eclipse. Describe what you observed. What if anything surprised you, what would you do differently? Why? What are the umbra and the penumbra? I walk past the woodpecker tree, a sound like the insistence of light on my eye. Often when I'm speaking or listening, I'm speaking, yes, or listening, but also from the pain, acutely aware of looking, your mouth moving, what rests above your shoulder in the distance river, Looking become pilgrimage, I travailing this long desire for rest, but no rest, just this sharp stab along the optical nerve. What if anything surprised you? I am loud outside myself, but from an exterior perspective, not so much. Sometimes I wish to put my eye out. The sky will not cease its pour, and there seems no true darkness, just as there seems no true silence. They say that even the giraffes are humming, the mice are singing. The giraffes are humming, the trees are communicating. I cannot sleep and find I've forgotten to breathe. The way the body says so is by gasping. What would you do differently? 
For years I tried to worry the world into containment, even as the condom got lost inside of me or something blotted out the sun. It has taken me forever to be obedient to the beautiful rather than the easy things. Your language is unbelievable. Thank you, Malia Collins. <laughs> um, so Trailhead came out in the spring. What are you working on now? Um, new poems, but I don't know what they are yet or what they're going to add up to. I just have no idea. I'm stumbling along without being able to see what comes next. So, yeah. What about you? I So I'm working, I've, I sometimes worry that I'm a one-trick pony, but then I think that's okay. Hmm. Um, and I'm really into writing these pieces of creative nonfiction about Hawaii and we do these, this is um, my precious Josh in the second row up here, and he's a good adventurer. And so every summer we go home to Hawaii and we do these adventures and something always happens. And so we um, did a hike on, the, on Hawaii Island, which is, people call it the big island, and these crazy things happen. And then we were in Koho'olawe last summer and these crazy things happen. And I just, and now I think, do I go f knowing that this ends up being something that I turn into a story? And if I know that, do I experience this place differently? But mm. I, I'm writing about Hawaii and I feel excited about these pieces. I wrote fiction for a long time and I think I'm still more of a fiction writer, but I'm sort of entranced with creative nonfiction mm. right now. And it's fun to write. And to dwell in that space. Does for a while. Josh perceive the crazy things as being as crazy as you perceive them? No. no. <laughs> he doesn't. Really. And sometimes I think Josh is going to out me um, on, on these moments. But then I say, no, babe, like it really happened that way. And he says, all right. But I also feel like Josh experiences it differently because he's not Hawaiian. And mm. so this place isn't in his blood in his cells and his DNA the way that it is for me and I think when we go into these wild places in Hawaii he um he understands that it's beautiful and magical and and singular and mystical and that he's lucky to be in these places but everything uh visits me because they know I hope this doesn't sound crazy, but they know that I'm going to be the one who's going to do something good about it. And so I feel like, I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert who says, if an idea comes to you and you don't take it, it's going to flit off and find somebody else. And I feel like in Hawaii, they know if they land anywhere near me that I'm going to take it and there's I'm going to do something good with it and they're going to be taken care of. And so... That's what I'm working on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I'm suddenly trying to look at my watch. Mm -hmm. um, we are just about at the end here. So Carrie's going to read. One more poem. Another poem. And then Carrie and Speedy worked on this really beautiful collaboration in the stairwell. And a stairwell is a re has great, a great acoustic space. Absolutely. And I thought we should have some sort of series like the stairwell series, <laughs> where we all just sit on the stairs and then someone plays music and then Carrie reads her poems. Mm. So Carrie, will you read another okay. piece for us? So speaking of mystical or visionary experience, this is um, a take on the female mystic Julian of Norwich, who many of you have probably encountered before, she wrote this incredibly elaborate table of contents to her classic book of, of visions um, called Revelations of Divine Love. So this is actually, uh, the title comes from her, and then it's actually sort of a take on her table of contents. So this is her title that became my title. Autobiographical, the fall through fealty of nature by self-regarding into doubt of the showing of love, the rescue by mercy, the assaying of faith, and the overcoming by grace. So. One, 
the ice in the bowl broken up with the boot heel, two, the bodily sickness following the emptying of the womb, three, the hallucinated desert, the tumbleweed glowing, the bones shed when the animal deceased and yarrow split through those bones, four, the plentitude of onions fallen from the truck along the highway gathered, five, the vision of Christ wombed and heavy, Six, dabbling in earthly love, the renunciation of earthly love, the revelation of grief as moth, as a moth that drinks from our sleeping eyes, the mad girl, the least among us, and the opening of the soul into charity. Seven, the apparition of the friend, the possibility of arriving at a new dispensation outside time, yet not outside providence, the parable of the onion broth, Eight, the days of sleep, the curtains drawn, real rabbit hair suspended in false courts. Nine, the citizen activism of the dead. 10, the refusal of the women to bear the cries of the world, the bafflement of the men in search of succor, as seen through the grown man now at the woman's teat, now at the sows. 11, the time into arc of the star altitude curves, 12. The hawk who grabs the small dog's head, crafting a permanent concavity that in no way lessens the contentment of the dog. 12. The wearing of amulets on which has been spent the rent money, the pawning of devices, the many crosses in the vitrine or are they keys. 14. The stubborn tooth excised from the mouth, blood pulp affixed, the question of ownership as unrelated to the question of provenance. 15. Somatism as worldview, the women shaking, the women holding their heads in their hands. 16. A hammer and a hawk feather may fall at the same speed. This has been proven. 17. All being is being of God and is good. Sin is no being. 18. The tooth mailed priority to a new possessor. 19. The perfection of the body as seen in the cool forehead of the dead woman. 20. The ice in the bull reformed. The doctrine of nonlinear revelation. The infinite penetrability of man. 21. The seizures of the content dog. ask do you ever get stuck and don't have things to write oh about? god yes yeah usually for about a year after a book comes out i am just so stuck you're in that time. and writing horribly and then deleting things and writing horribly some more and then deleting things and yeah. do you have things that you read that help you get unstuck anything i read helps me i mean eventually get unstuck but yeah and often i do i turn to fiction and i turn to to mm people who write far better than I ever will, like I'll reread Moby Dick, which is my favorite book, or I'll read Nabokov, or I'll read Virginia Woolf, who's a poet at heart. Yeah. Reading helps. It does. Yeah. Speedy, how about you? Do you ever get stuck when you're writing songs? I always worry about it, but then it doesn't happen. You know, I mean, I, I, it, it, I, I go through, I think, oh gosh, am I ever going to write anything ever again? And then it just, then it starts. I start hearing the symphonies in my head and they just happen. It, it, we, would it be okay if I squeezed in one? Yeah, more? absolutely. Okay, all right. Yeah, for um, sure. Uh, just, I wanted, because of something that you guys have both brought up about uh, the sense of environment that you talk about, and I can't say Hawaii properly, but Hawaii, and then you talk about here in the mm -hmm. foothills. Um, I grew up in the South, but also uh, at the beach in the South, and, and there's, a, there's a certain feeling of that every, 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 every place feels different to me, and there's something about the, 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 the beaches of South Carolina, and, and that, that's what this song is about. I'll try, to, I'll try to not make it stretch out too long, but uh, uh, this is called Imago. Um, I don't 
you should look up what Imago means, but I don't like really like talking about what songs are about, but if you can imagine that this takes place at the beach and then you can look up Imago and you can maybe get an idea of what this is. She came from California to help a old man start again After he lost his second wife To someone he called friend And she was barefoot on the boardwalk With the ocean in her eyes The sun burst in her hair And the air was electrified summer in Carolina and it was sad and it was long and everything was golden nothing could go wrong She wore lace-up linen blouses She had roses on her jeans She had freckles on her nose It was just like in my dreams And I'd watch her on the stage As she danced behind the bar One day she came to me Would you like to float away? It was summer in Carolina And it was sad and it was long And everything was golden Nothing could go wrong her sleep. She was naked like the sunrise and perfect in my sheets. And it was summer in Carolina. And it was sad and it was long. Everything was golden and nothing could go wrong. collaboration with Speedy Play Music and Speedy the Music is from a song on Ragged Coyote yeah called uh, Something God Might Say hmm. and Carrie's gonna be reading and that, what I'm gonna be reading is actually not my poem but I thought in the spirit of friendship and mentorship and community I wanted to read Elizabeth Bishop's poem um, that she wrote for Marianne Moore who she adored and it's called Invitation to Miss Marianne Moore. I need just another second here. You got it. Who is Marianne Moore? <laughs> um, modernist be. poet. I know, I know the name, but what should we know about her? What? What should we know about her? What should you know about her? She was a, a poet who paid extreme attention to the natural world. She wrote these very precise poems um, in which, what did we look at? Did we look at the jellyfish? Was that our class? Yeah, there's a poem called The Jellyfish, which you would love, but they're almost like little Fabergé eggs of poems. They're so beautiful and so precise, yes. And also, according to uh, common lore, she remained a virgin her entire life. So you should know that about Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, think, I think Elizabeth Bishop was maybe a little bit in love with her. So. 
I just want to say thank you guys. Oh, thank, thank, you. thank you. This is a to Miss Marianne Moore. From Brooklyn, over the Brooklyn Bridge, on this fine morning, please come flying. In a cloud of fiery pale chemicals, please come flying. To the rapid rolling of thousands of small blue drums descending out of the mackerel sky, over the glistening grandstand of harbor water, please come flying. Whistles, pennants, and smoke are blowing. The ships are signaling cordially with multitudes of flags rising and falling like birds all over the harbor. Enter two rivers, gracefully bearing countless little pellucid jellies in cut glass dragging with silver chains. The flight is safe, the weather is all arranged, the waves are running in verses this fine morning. Please come fly. Come with the pointed toe of each black shoe trailing a sapphire highlight, with a black cape full of butterfly wings and bon mots, with heaven knows how many angels all riding on the broad black brim of your hat, please come fly. Bearing a musical, inaudible abacus, a slight censorious frown, and blue ribbons, please come fly. Facts and skyscrapers glint in the tide. Manhattan is all awash with morals this fine morning, so please come flying. Mounting the sky with natural heroism above the accidents, above the malignant movies, the taxi cabs and injustices at large, while horns are resounding in your beautiful ears that simultaneously listen to a soft, uninvented music fit for the musk deer, please come flying. For whom the grim museums will behave like courteous male bower birds. For whom the agreeable lions lie in wait on the steps of the public library, eager to rise and follow through the doors up into the reading rooms. Please come, come fly. We can sit down and weep. We can go shopping or play at a game of constantly being wrong with a priceless set of vocabularies. Or we can bravely deplore, but please, please come fly with dynasties of negative constructions darkening and dying around you, with grammar that suddenly turns and shines like flocks of sandpipers flying, please come flying. Come like a light in the white mackerel sky. Come like a daytime comet with a long, unnebulous train of words from Bro Brooklyn over the Brooklyn Bridge on this fine morning, please come flying. Like I'll drive, you are in the back seat playing guitar, and then you are reading <laughs> and stealing, stealing rocks <laughs> and stealing rocks, and then we stop and we write something and read it to each other. That sounds good. Yeah. I've got a van. Thank you. Do a high five here, all the way around the board. That was fun. That was so good. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for you know being here for you and then like Radio Boise like the volunteers. Thank you. Oh, like, yeah. 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 Speaking of the volunteer, also here normally doing the music, like behind the scenes music stuff. Mm. So like you put in so many hours and like all your crew and Wayne and just I don't she's Jess is not in the room right now, <laughs> but oh my gosh, it's so cool to see these uh, I don't know this community sort of radio station sort of putting on some really amazing sort of interesting events outside of even like the the music realm like that the, the, the process behind it and so at story four we're going to have a couple of these things going on as well and um Ali is also involved in a couple other things at story four which would be great but i really appreciate you guys coming out tonight and um supporting all this and we'll get the next season put together and, and have some you know some good Excuse me, Christian. Uh, we're going to, we did this last year, and we're probably going to do it again this year. But on Sunday of Tree Fort, we will possibly, check with us, have acoustic musicians in here with the chairs like this 
And so we did it last year with four acts, uh, like every hour and a half. So we're hoping that we probably will do it again this year. So so it's very similar to this, except it's you'll be doing the cow surfer out there, and but this will be like just musicians playing twenty minute sets. So uh, and it's free to anybody. And it's free you to anybody. You don't have to have a Treeport pass. Oh, that's awesome. nice. So yeah, it will is really so awesome last year. Yes. So and it was because of you're doing this that I was like, we should do this with we're even hoping, fingers crossed, we might be getting some collaborations between musicians that have not worked together before. Oh, but nice. we'll see. We'll see nice. how that goes. But keep that in mind. So that's even awesome. if you're not a tree fork pass holder, this will be available. Yes. As is the uh, Radio Voices. Right, right, right. That is too. So, yeah, exactly. And Storyboard. And yeah. Story from yeah. Storyboard. Yeah. <laughs> There's some free stuff. So. I will give all the shout out stuff to things for Storyboard, but I, I mean, we're excited about it. And the, yeah. the, the official schedule hits for the entire festival on Thursday. So mm. um, we're you know, stoked, but it's it's kind of like nostalgic. It's been, like, I don't know. Here we are, the last like episode for I don't know another six months. I know this was a this <laughs> so, was a good closeout to this. Yes, season. it was. So thank you so very thank much. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. 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 By the way, I, did, I, I saw CDs. I do so, have CDs. Yeah. I don't know if Carrie. I'm leaving. Well, I didn't books. bring books. I always forget to bring books. books. Oh, Carrie's books. Carrie's books. Books. Carrie's I'm leaving on tour, so, so I can good. use your money. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Good night, everybody.